We have, thank you everyone for coming to the capstone presentations this morning. We have Madison Daggett, who's gonna be presenting on the world of speech and language pathology. Um, she'll be running the presentation this morning and I'm gonna let her get started and I'll turn it over to her. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. Okay. So this is the world of speech language pathology. I mean. So what I'm going to be talking about today is basically the occupation of um, speech language pathology as a whole, like who are speech language pathologists or SLPs for short, um, what jobs do they do, where do they work, um, what kind of clientele do they um, work with, and what education requirements do they need. And I'm also going to be talking about the history behind the career, including the evolution of practices and the founders of um, speech language pathology in America. And I'm also going to be talking about the common disorders and methods of treatment for these disorders and the differences depending on the type of clientele or diagnosis. And lastly, I'm going to be focusing on the assistive technology portion within the field, which is AAC technology and then conclusion, like why I learned about the, the profession. So speech language pathology, what is it? And better yet, how does it affect our lives and those who we love? So speech language pathologists work to prevent, assess, diagnose, and treat disorders of speech, which occur when a person has difficulty producing speech sounds correctly or fluently, um, for example, like a stutter, or has issues with the resonance of their voice, like the loudness of their voice. There's also language disorders when a person has trouble um, understanding others, um, which is receptive language, or sharing different thoughts, ideas, or emotions, which is expressive, expressive language, sorry. And it could be either written or spoken and involve the form of phonology, morphology, syntax, et cetera. Um, and then social communication disorders, which is trouble with the social use of verbal and nonverbal communication. This is um, like greeting someone, asking questions, and like also adjusting the way we speak according to, to the audience and setting that you're in. And then there's also cognitive communication disorders, which are problems involving organizing thoughts, paying attention, remembering, planning, and or sol uh, problem solving. And then this is probably um, less commonly known, but there's also swallowing disorders called um, that are like feeding and swallowing difficulties, which may follow like having an illness, surgery, stroke, or injury. And then these are in all types of patients. Additional parts of the job can, can include providing oral rehabilitation for those who are deaf or hard of hearing, um, providing AAC systems for, for those with expressive and or language comprehension disorders. And um, those um, systems or communication devices are often um, uh, given to those with who are on the autism, autism spectrum because um, many are nonverbal. Um, and then it's also um, working with individuals that simply want to learn how to communicate more effectively or comfortably. For instance, um, if someone was transitioning from male to female, they could go to a speech language pathologist to get voice training if they want to make their um, voice sound more feminine and be really comfortable with their identity, that's an option for them. So the types of patients treated is a wide variety. There's people of all ages. Some patients need treatment due to neurological events that have occurred in their life, such as a stroke, brain damage, all, all, all different types, that, and it's impacted their speech as a result. And um, SLPs also may work with patients who suffer from chronic diseases or who have experienced trauma in their lives. Children are also very common patients and can be given treatment for a wide variety of diagnosis, which I'll, I will go into later. So where do SLPs work? They can work in a variety of settings, including hospitals, outpatient clinics, educational settings like schools, private practices, and even in governments and facilities um, typically work on improving skills to function more independently. And many of these work environments encourage a lot of collaboration between speech therapists and other specialists or figures that their um, clients will see in their day to day, including audiologists, teachers, physicians, psychologists, social workers, the list goes on. Even parents, the list is really long. So we can see here that in the educational setting, 56% of SLPs work in that sort of setting. 
39 in the healthcare setting and 19% in a private practice that they own or co-own. So the path to becoming an SLP is long, but not as long as medical school would be, but it's still um, school after um, high school, a lot of school after high school. So first you have to complete an undergraduate program in communication sciences and disorders or a program that's similar. Um, they, some schools offer speech, like pre-speech language pathology programs. And um, I was talking with my mentor and we sometimes you don't even need to do that. Like you can um, have an undergrad in like psychology per se, but then just have to take a summer course with credits that can get you in to our next step, which is a master's program or a CAA accredited graduate degree in speech language pathology or something related to it. So those are two different options, just going through the communication sciences and disorders um, undergrad to, straight to the master's or just having something different and then taking those summer classes. You also have to complete a postgraduate fellowship, which is like working closely with someone who's already an SLP. And you can take your exam um, that you need for certification during your fellowship. So you can kind of get a two for one deal. And then finally, once you have taken your exams and gotten all your schooling, you can apply for your state um, um, certification and um, finally get, get your certification after you pass it. So the projected uh, job growth for SLPs is 21% through 2024, and it, the number keeps increasing, increasing. However, there is a current shortage throughout the U.S., so um, especially um, due to the pandemic, a lot of them work in the educational settings, and it, it's just been a hard year this year. So next category is the history behind the career and how did this type of therapy start and how has it evolved? So, the roots of speech language pathology in America. So, the first SLPs obviously were not certified, but rather to help others with speech and language. And um, the, the term quacks refers to the people that during this like beginning development of speech therapy in America, um, these were the people that used to give out phony advice. So that's what the name for them was. Um, the uh, speech, speech language pathology in America also contains roots in elocution, which is speech perfection stemming from the 18th, from 18th century England. And there's an emphasis on elocution in American society, but that's, this was replaced by communication disorders with the publication of a book by Samuel Potter um, called Speech and Its Defects. And um, later the American Academy of Speech Cor Correction was established in 1926. And surprisingly, there was a uh, World War II in, um, impact on public interest of the career because um, a lot of veterans were coming home with brain injuries that led to um, a lot of speech disorders within veterans and stutters and um, things of that nature. So it impacted the amount of efforts that were put towards speech assistance and therapy during this time. So Samuel Potter uh, published this book in 1882 um, he was the first to publicly share ideas about communication and speech as well as the methods for improving both of them. Um, Sarah Stinchfield was also the first person in America to receive a PhD in speech pathology in 1928 from the University of Wisconsin. And Lee Edward Travis founded the American Academy of Speech Correction, which is now ASHA, in 1925. And then here's some pictures of these important figures. I couldn't find a picture of Samuel Potter, but this is um, other important figures to speech pathology in America. So the formation of ASHA um, occurred in 1925, which it was originally the AAC, uh, sorry, AASC, um, and ASHA is the American um, Speech and Language and Hearing Association. And it was founded in 1925 with 25 members. And all these members are affiliated with different universities and blossoming speech programs across the country. And now this association is a professional association for speech language pathologists, audiologists, and speech over 200,000 members. And now this is the organization that provides accreditation for SLPs today. So now, um, comparing to them, um, now we have specific tools and technology that have been developed to both um, help others with their communication to be, and to be able to make a diagnosis of a certain um, impairment. But then there's limited tools to study this um, field. Um, so client speech was often recorded on wax phonograph cylinders, sound waves, 
um, were scratched on smoked chymograph um, drums and tuning forks were utilized at various frequencies. So there's definitely been a big shift in technology used in speech language pathology since it was first discovered or first um, recognized. So what are some common speech and language impairments and how can they be treated today? So the number one, probably most common um, speech disorder or um, impairment you're gonna see is praxia of speech. And this occurs when a neural pathway between the brain and a person's speech ability is either lost or obscured. So this basically um, means that the brain knows what it wants to say, but it's unable to give speech, the speech muscles in your um, mouth, the ability to say that word or phrase. Um, there's a significant difference between acquired AOS and childhood AOS. Acquired is through um, brain damage that you um, receive during life, and then childhood is just from when you're born. Milder cases are difficult to diagnose, but the major symptoms are um, really an inability to articulate words, um, groping for sound positions, off-target movement that movements that distort sounds, and inconsistency with your pronunciation of words. So methods of uh, treatment include touch cues, like putting the finger on the lips when saying a certain letter, like P. Um, visual cues, like looking into a mirror when making sounds, to, so you can really see your muscles working in your mouth. And listening cues, like practicing sounds with a recorder and then listening to hear if they sound correctly. Um, the, the basic um, key to um, doing this type of treatment is practicing words, syllables, and phrases. and um, it, therapy is also recommended three to five times a week, especially for children. And remember, this type of, of disorder is not about the strength of the mouth, it's about the signals that are being sent from your brain to your mouth. Number two would be stuttering, which is probably um, a disorder or impairment that we're most common with. It's also referred to as stammering, and we all have disfluencies when we talk. However, stuttering includes repetition of words, prolongations, as well as word blocks and certain events or social situations may impact how much a person stutters. For example, if you're on an important conference call with your boss, you'd probably be more nervous and more likely to stutter than if you were just having a casual conversation with your friends, children, and its results, unless it's diagnosed from childhood and it's not treated. Um, major symptoms or signs include long pauses during sentences, repetition of certain words, and even involuntary blinking during the stuttering. Methods of treatment include um, fluency shaping, which is using delayed auditory feedback to assist stuttering modification, which is identifying and adjusting disfluencies when they occur. And in this situation, it really helps reduce tension and this fear and like embarrassment of stuttering for the person who suffers from the stutter. And early intervention is key. It's the early the treatment that a child is um, receiving, the more likely that they can solve the stutter and not have to deal with it later in their adult life when if they want to get a job or go to school so yeah and then this one is called dys dysarthria um motor speech it's a motor speech disorder in which speech producing muscles are weakened paralyzed is caused by damage to the brain a peripheral dysarthria is caused by damage to what the or um what organs we need for speech so you can be diagnosed with dysarthria at any age, but it's more commonly developed later in life. Um, it can also be developed in the womb, like uh, for example, with cerebral palsy, ALS, and other um, neurological disorders. Um, symptoms include slurred and slowed speech, limited jaw, um, tongue and lip movement, abnormal rhythm and pitch when speaking, changes in voice quality, um, and difficult articulate, articulating, and labored speech in general. The methods of treatment include exercises to strengthen the mouth muscles and breath, breath training, um, which is different than apraxia because that's more like the signal going to your mouth. And then slowing down your speech up first and focusing on saying the word, um, even if it's just one clearly, is really a good method of this type of um, diagnosis. And up to 30% of people with ALS have dysarthria, and as well as 25 to 50% of people with MS at some point in their lives will have dysarthria. Um, this is called dysphagia, and it's a medical term for swallowing difficulties, which is often not what we think of when we think of speech therapy. Um, in adults, it causes um, 
causes include conditions of the nervous system, um, throat and mouth cancers, and gastroesophageal um, reflux disease, which is um, a, a disease where stomach acid leaks back into the esophagus, kind of gross, but it's true. Um, in children, it's usually a result of development or um, of a development or learning disability. And symptoms include general coughing and choking when eating, food being stuck in your throat, persistent drooling, and in serious cases, pneumonia and weight loss due to the lack of food you're eating. And then for the pneumonia, um, the, the infections that you're getting in your lung from the food staying and beverages staying in there. So methods of treatment would include simply changing the consistency of foods and beverages to make them easier to swallow. For example, water, you can make it thicker using um, a, a certain like gelatin powder, I think. Um, you could also have learning um, new swallowing techniques such as using a straw, and then even surgery to widen the esophagus by stretching it or inserting a plastic or metal tube. And um, full avoidance of eating and drinking right now mouth can also be done through a feeding tube if this, this um, diagnosis is really serious. So finally, I have um, assistive technology, in the, and especially um, over the last couple of sister Sydney. Um, Sydney is my twin sister, and for entire her most of her life, she's been using a communica communication device, as you can see here. Um, she is on the autism spectrum, and um, she does have apraxia too, and she's just nonverbal in general. And so my understanding has been her using this the, her entire life and um, in communicating with me and my family members through this different form of technology that not a lot of people know about. It's basically her lifeline. She um, tells us all her wants and needs through this device. And I don't know where, our, where she would be without it today. So yeah, so that's my sister. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you some examples of her talk. There you go. So this would be basic facts about her. Sorry, it might take a, a second. Sydney, tell, tell me some things about yourself. Sorry. What, when's your birthday? You want to try turning your camera off? Sometimes the connection's a little better, Maddie. Okay. Here, I can go, go to the next video. Basically, what she's um, doing in this. Sorry, it's there. You go. What okay. she's doing? Birthday is August 13th. There you go. Yeah. Okay, so she said her birthday was August 13th. So let's try it. Maybe. Sydney, what's your favorite movie? Let's try it this way. Maybe take your time. We we have plenty of time. You can wait for it to load. Okay, let me replay that. Sydney, what's your favorite movie? Charlotte's Web. Favorite movie, Charlotte's Web. Who's your favorite character from Charlotte's Web? Pig. Wilbur the Pig. Nice job, Sid. So basically she said her favorite um, character is Wilbur the Pig in Charlotte's Web, and then this is a follow-up video. Sydney, can you show us how you type out the word Wilbur?
I want to show the, the full screen, but that's okay. Cindy, can you show us how you type out the word Wilbur? So that's how she types out her word Wilbur from the previous video when we were discussing um, favorite movie. And then I'll do one more. I can skip one of these videos because I know the connections at the best, but this is her answering another question. Yeah, let's see. There you go. Sid, what do you want to eat right now? Cotton. I want cotton candy. And how would you ask for that nicely? Candy. Please. I want cotton candy, please. Good job. So you can see here, I'll turn my video back on. There you go. So you can see that she uses um, her device in many different ways. She uses it to type. She also has different categories that are already placed on there um, for if she wants to say something specific um, or about her life, like personalized to her life. And she's really good at going back and forth um, between categories. And it's she's gotten like she does it way better than I could ever do it. And you can even see that she like deletes certain words when she wants to, or if she like typed a, like a letter wrong, she does it right away. So she's definitely gotten better at that. Oh, sorry. Sid, what do you want to eat right now? Ah, there you go. Okay. So you can see that um, there's one that augmentative and alternative communication device, but there's also so many others. There's, um, besides the one that I'm listing, there's also ones where it's just the, like a board with certain categories instead of just a, um, the technology. It's like um, a more... Um, you know, it's just like a more uh, basic version without the technology. But there's also, as you can see, delayed auditory feedback devices that um, um, play back the vo your voice in your head to like get rid of a stutter um, and help you through that process. There's also applications that can teach you, you and chil children mostly, um, articulation, storytelling, and any more useful skills through games and activities. Um, there's art articulation station, speech journal, Pictello, and so many more. And there's also text, telephone, or telecommunication devices called TTYs or TTD machines. And these are devices that can read type messages out loud to a person on the other end of a phone call. So um, improvements to be made in this field. Um, as you could probably hear from the videos, the voices within the AAC devices um, sound kind of If um, synthers would be to make more natural, um, especially for a teenager, like you don't want it to sound like a grown woman, you know. And there's also brain computer interface research in which new uh, neural sig signals are attempted to be translated to words and computers. And um, this would like obviously be life changing for people who are fully handicapped or disabled um, and are also nonverbal, so they could communicate their needs but not have to like move. In a, um, in a way. So those are some improvements that need to be made, in my opinion. And in conclusion, speech language pathology, in my opinion, is important due to the great impact the field that it has on the lives of our loved ones, whether we know it or not. All, a lot of people we know probably go to speech therapy and we wouldn't even know it. Uh, speech is the number way, one way of communication between humans and being able to provide someone with that gift of improved communication is a beautiful opportunity for, uh, for anyone. Thank you for watching. Nice job, Maddie. Awesome. You can come off of um, share and we'll just open it up for a discussion. I just wanna give you some feedback. I'm just so impressed. You really did an excellent job. And I love how you added um, Sid into the um, into the presentation and her videos and I was it was really helpful to see it firsthand. I've never I've known about assistive technology, but I never knew kind of how it actually works, um, and it's incredible.
Um, and I also just want to say that your approach and your demeanor, you have such a patient way about you. That's just really, really impressive. And I, I hope that you follow this field because you, you've got a knack for it. You can just tell. It's really impressive. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm just going to open up um, the discussion. People who are listening in, you could either ask questions out loud by using the raise hand function on Zoom, or you could put questions in the chat and I could read them out loud and comments as well. Someone said, awesome job. You would agree. How did you find out about the possible improvements? Like, I really like how you put about improvements possibly, but how did you know about those possibilities? Was that part of your research in terms of how to make things better? So, I mean, with any technology, there's possible improvements that could um, occur in the future. But um, a few years ago, um, I, my parents and um, some of my uh, sisters, administrators and teachers were looking into having me record some common words that Sydney uses so she could use my voice to talk. Oh my so God. I was wondering if like, yeah, if there was something related to, to that in the future. We didn't really go through with it, but I feel like um, it would be great if my sister was just able to like talk like a teenage girl in a way. I feel oh like she's been robbed of that. Like she's been robbed of so many like um, things in her teenage years and I feel like it would just be so great for her to have like a voice that like would sound like her own in a way and th what they would do is they would augment my my voice to sound maybe something that would sound similar to hers maybe like higher or deeper I don't know I don't know the exact process but I was just thinking about that and I thought it was cool absolutely yeah and I don't see why it's not capable um I mean if you think about the different apps that we use like I think even, I don't know if you use the Waze app, but you can switch like the voices on there. So it's kind of exactly what you're talking about is you can switch to different voices. And if you have words recorded already, that's that's brilliant. That's really impressive actually. Yeah, because it makes more sense to have it like that than be more of a robotic sound for sure. Um, Hal said, thanks for the great information. Yeah, I think we could all agree. And, and I like what you said at the end about, you know, people can benefit from speech and language no, no matter what facet spectrum that they're on. Um, I know that my cousin who is now doing a master's program, um, she had speech and language services as a toddler into elementary school. Um, and her mom just noticed that she needed a little bit of support and she ended up being the valedictorian of her high school and now off to college and off to master's program. So it, you know, really I know made a huge difference for her. So it's a wonderful field. I hope you I hope you think about continuing to stick with it because you'll be good at it. Yeah, I hope so. I feel like it would be like a really rewarding job to have. Definitely. And just be able to, uh, like especially work with kids that I feel like that would be great seeing their development too Absolutely. over the years. Mm -hmm. so. so what's next for you? Um, any summer plans related to this or just general summer plans that you want to share? Um, I am, uh, I did this this summer before the pandemic, but, um, I'm also going to be volunteering at Calvin Lee, um, with the, um, special ed preschool class. I'm going to be volunteering the entire summer for their program nice. with the teachers. I help, I just help them out. So I'm going to be doing that this summer. Awesome. Um, I have town band this summer college tours this summer. That's, that's, that's basically it. Busy. That's a lot. <laughs> well, congratulations. Excellent job. Sorry, um, That's okay. Um, all right. So for those of you who are listening yes. in, um, congratulations to Maddie. And our next presenter is Rosalie Coleman. Okay. Hopefully this works. I'm not sure it will though. Um, I'll let so you guys I can't hear something. I'll let you know. Okay, well, I'm Rosalie, as you know, and i um, senior, and I've been playing the fiddle and classical violin since I was four, and also I've picked up the banjo and viola since then, um, and I'm actually going to be going to Oberlin to study in their musical studies program, um, probably doing some amount of ethnic as well as computer music. Um, so I created this project. Um, 
to um, dig deeper into a potential field of study for me. And um, yeah, and I hope you enjoy. Um, so what exactly is ethnomusicology? By dictionary de definition, it's the study of music from different cultures, especially non-Western ones. And by non-Western, it generally refers to all like world folk music traditions that excludes like European classical music. Um, but if you do want to study and analyze classical music, um, there is a field for that called musicology. Um, and in many ways, ethnomusicology is just the anthropological study of music or like the study of musical traditions and how they function within a social and cultural context. Um, so ethnomusicology is an incredibly interdisciplinary field of study. Um, so it basically has music and it brings together um, cultural anthropology and folklore and performance studies, dance, cultural studies, gender, race, ethnic studies, and um, a whole other array of um, fields in the humanities and social sciences. Um, and in ethnomusicology, ecologist's role can be like more or less broken down into three categories which are like research preservation and education um so the first one i'm going to talk about is research and this entails two things which are studying music from a specific part of the world and investigating its connections and to elements of social and cultural life um and the second aspect is interacting directly with musical communities that are being studied um so to code deeper into this, um, we must understand that the scope of traditional music is like very wide. I mean, it spans across the entire globe within nearly every corner of the globe has its like own musical traditions. And if you, you know, take a specific musical tradition, um, it can be further broken down into different, you know, regions within a country, similarly to like kind of how a language is broken down into different dialects. Um, and so if you look over at the US, there's a couple of big dots on um, this arrow is pointing to like kind of the Southeastern United States, um, which is where sort of like the Appalachian um, string band music tradition sort of thrives. And then there's up in New England where we are, um, there's a thriving scene of contra dance music as well as um, Quebecois and Franco-American music from Quebec. Um, and then the other one I wanted to point out was this dot up here in the Dakotas, which is actually a fairly big dot and isn't really like talked about a lot. And it's the Métis people of the Dakotas and Southern Canada, um, which is an indigenous group of people that um, have their own genre of fiddling that's very closely related with like um, Quebecois music and also kind of Scots-Irish influence as well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different a lot of different places in the world with folk traditions. Um, and so generally an ethnomusicologist will like focus on, I have change the slides, hold on. Uh, <laughs> um, so generally an ethnomusicologist will focus on a specific part of the world when they're studying um, and they'll dedicate their entire career to like studying one specific area. Um, and See, I know I changed the blah. Okay, but yeah, um, music is like an inherently social activity, um, and so it's critical for ethnomusicologists to interact with their communities that are they're studying, and this includes traveling to and participating in projects and research that involve cultural policy or arts programming and advocacy advocacy um, on behalf of the musicians. Um, and as educators, um, they share their research and knowledge by teaching workshops and seminars or courses um, on the music of the world um, and a specific musical tradition or cultural study of music, as well as like publishing books, articles, or, you know, sharing their work through other forms of media. Um, and more importantly than teaching classes is um, their role tends to fall like as a pr preservationist um, and they also like are very um, so then like as preservationists ethnomusicologists 
um, kind of take on the responsibility to document and promote musical traditions. Um, and they work a lot with museums and archives and other arts presenting organizations like schools and media companies um, to promote and um, like the appreciation for and understanding for Walt's music. Um, so now to kind of go into the meat and bones of my project. Um, I kind of put together like this mini case study type thing on for Appalachian string band music, um, similar to, to like try and replicate what like the work that an ethnomusicologist would might do. Um, and there were some limitations uh, actually because of the pandemic. It was really hard to go could to any festivals or um, concerts or workshops that would relate to the subject, but I kind of was able to work around some of this by attending virtual things. Um, so I put together a small presentation on like the history of Appalachian music, and I hope you learned some stuff. Um, so this is a map of what generally is considered to be the Appalachian region, um, and it more or less follows the Appalachian mountain ranges. Um, and very common misconception about um, string band music in the southeastern United States is that it's like the mountain music of you know the Carolinas, Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia. However, really, that's like not entirely the case. Um, I mean, this isn't completely wrong because a bulk of the music is played in those rural mountain areas. Um, but I drew this kind of rough sketch here. Uh, it's like kind of a bit more of a more accurate representation of like where Appalachian music really is played. Um, so you can see that it um, is not limited to the mountains. It reaches the Atlantic coast and goes up north into parts of southeastern Pennsylvania and to Ohio and Indiana and parts of across the parts of Missouri and into parts of Oklahoma and then down into the Ozarks in Arkansas and Mississippi across Alabama and back into Georgia. Um, so yeah, it's a very, uh, very wide area of geographical land. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the origins of Appalachian music. Um, so it started aboard slave ships and where slaves would often play and sing music and dance. Um, and they did this for exercise, but also to boost morale. Um, and once they became, uh, kind of got to the U.S., um, their tradition started to sort of intertwine with those of the Irish, Scots-Irish settlers um, in the Appalachian Mountains. And, in, uh, you know, that both groups, when they kind of came to the U.S., brought um, their traditions with them. And so the African-Americans brought, um, they brought an instrument that's like very similar to what's now known as the banjo and um the europeans usually they brought like over the fiddle and so when the two of them kind of combined this is sort of those are like the two core instruments of appalachian music um and you know it's also another misconception is that like the rhythm came from africa and the melodies came from europe but in reality, a lot of the melodies are very similar to those that would be played in African traditions even today. Um, but it is like the, like the, like the bones of Appalachian music definitely are those uh, African drumming rhythms and they like fit perfectly over the melodies, um, which is really cool. Um, and uh, there's like not much documentation on music that was played by the slaves. Um, and this is very reflective of like the oppressive nature um, and like the dominant classes la lack of interest and appreciation for like any form of cultural ex expression that the slaves made. Um, but there are still reports of slaves playing banjo and percussion instruments in the American colonies and on plantations as early as like the late 17th century um, where they would um, uh, usually play to entertain themselves, but they also often played to entertain um, white people as well. Um, then into the early to mid 1800s, throughout like the Reconstruction and Jim Crow era of the United States, there was a rise in popularity of minstrel shows. Um, and these shows typically use blackface as well as stereotypical instruments and stock characters to mock black um, 
culture. And this picture here is one of the known characters that was used in minstrel shows, Old Dan Tucker. Um, and the lyrics, which I put some of them, like excerpts from them on the side there, um, are like use a very exaggerated, um, like black vernacular language. Um, and they tell an, a story of Old Dan Tucker um, and his journey in this town um, where he fights people and gets drunk, overeats, and just breaks all of these different social taboos throughout the song. Um, and so it's songs like these that uh, really did a lot to damage the you know, Black uh, cultural expression um, in the American South. And these shows continued well into the 1960s and 70s, and they became a global phenomenon. So minstrel tours would go to Europe usually as well, and um, they were extremely popular. Um, and another like kind of way that um, minstrel shows can be seen in to today as like the 21st century is through the ice cream truck song. Um, not all ice cream trucks use this song, but there is one in Guilford that does use it still. Um, and so when ice cream trucks first became popular, they, um, the like in the early 1900s, I think it was, and they would often play minstrel songs like Turkey in the Straw, which is the one that's most commonly heard today. Um, as like minstrelsy was still very much a global phenomenon and they were just trying to uh, kind of target their customers and what they would appreciate or like what they wanted to hear or something that they could recognize and associate with ice cream. And one of the reasons they chose minstrel songs was because a, they were very commonly played in ice cream parlors. Um, so it was really just a business strategy. Um, so I'll play a little bit of this. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear it. I don't think you will, but let me know. <laughs> Yeah, so that's Turkey in the Straw. I don't know if you recognized it, but <laughs> one of the ice cream trucks here does play it. Oh, it's playing it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so minstrel shows in combination with also like the rise of the recording industry led to a lot of black erasure in the genre. Um, so yeah, minstrel shows created like this external wedge that was driven between um, black musicians and it drove them away from their own traditions, generally, like most likely out of shame. Um, and with little like reconciliation or reparations, it didn't really take long for the mocking of their customs to uh, and personhood through minstrel shows to leave really deep wounds on the black community in America. Um, and then also the recording industry played a pretty big role in this as well. Um, early ethnomusicologists did a really poor job at accurately recording um, black musicians as well as their cultures. And they, since they were pretty much uh, always seeking out white musicians, um, black musicians also faced like a really big financial uh, disadvantage in, um, at this time as well. Um, so yeah, black musicians face near total erasure from Appalachian string band music, and this is really it's really bad since they played a massive part in creating it. Um, and it was very much became a whitewashed um, tradition. Um, yeah, so moving forwards, uh, this is Joe Thompson, and he was the last black fiddler to come from a long line of fiddlers dating back to slavery. Um, and he passed away in 2012 at 93 years old. Um, and there has been some work um, 
done to sort of uh, try and like re-diversify Appalachian music in recent years and also to create safer environments for marginalized communities at festivals and also within performance spaces and venues um because there's still a lot of discrimination and it's not a very it's not always the most welcoming community of people um and there's also been a, a very big rise and like ongoing conversations on like the deeply rooted um races deeply rooted <laughs> racism within this tradition um and with that being said i'd say that the future of the tradition still appears relatively optimistic um if there's keep change keeps happening it's possible that appalachian music will become more of a safe and welcoming community as well as um it will become more diverse and sort of start working backwards again. Um, so to end my presentation, I wanted to share a tune that I learned this past year um, from Jake Blount, who is a banjo and fiddler player, fiddle player um, that specializes in black and indigenous music. Um, and this tune is from Will Adams, who is a fiddler from a very highly segregated neighborhood in Washington, D.C., the Kengar neighborhood. Um, and this uh, tune was recorded by a really young Mike Seeger, who's a very well-known ethnomusicologist. Um, unfortunately, not very much is known about the fiddler Will Adams, um, but this is a great tune and it was recorded. And um it's called smoky hole so i'm gonna start by playing the source recording of this tune um which uh is the original recording from like the 1950s when seeger first recorded it and um this collection is housed at university of north carolina in their archives and then i'll also play um a video of me playing it as well It's on now. Well, I can play that better. The models I saw, them just so it's soft. <laughs> Yeah, he sort of just uh, ends abruptly there, but you did get a whole time to the tune, which is really all you need. Um, so yeah, here is a video of me playing it. That's it. <laughs> You're very talented. Nice job. How Thank long you. did you play for? Long time, right? Uh, yeah, I started playing when I was four. So. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. It was so interesting. I really enjoyed it.
Rosalie. Um, the, the music kind of reminds me of, I don't know if you've ever been to Savannah, but I have some family in Savannah, Georgia. It just kind of gives me like that feel, that tone of like the cobblestones and, you know, that old school like feel. I love it. It's very relaxing. I've really enjoyed your presentation and listening to the music. It's, it's incredible. Thank you. <laughs> what about everything you learned? What was that? Sorry. <laughs> what good about what you've learned? Do you feel like you mastered yeah. what you were hoping for? Yeah, I'm really, really, really happy with how it came out. Good. So tell me what you would say is like the biggest difference between, because I know you've done a lot of schooling between GHS and between ECA. What would you say is the biggest difference in terms of this experience with Capstone versus ECA and GHS and so on? Um, well, this really gave me uh, the chance to explore what I wanted to play. Um, I have a few opportunities at ECA to play fiddle music, mostly just in like concerts and stuff. Mm -hmm. but I don't always have a lot of time to sort of dig into what I want to, so I do it mostly on my own time. Yeah. Um, so this was a fun experience to kind of just do that and then also be able to share it, which was fun. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I'm glad that your mom was able to to join in as well. Um, I usually open up for a discussion at this point. I, I know you see your mom all the time, but if uh, Sarah, if you have anything you want to ask or share, you feel welcome to do that. Um, I am recording this, so I can certainly um, share that recording with you and we usually post to the YouTube channel too. So, um, and your mom said, good job, Ro. Thank well, you, Father. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, congratulations. You're all done.